God's a good God. And uh, he's really blessed us in different ways. And one of the great blessings that we have as individual people is to be able to live in this great land called America. Uh, we love America, but we, we don't like what we've been seeing for a number of years. It's been going on for 50 years, actually, and just a downturn and a weakening, a compromising, a watering down, and other, other uh, things that we thought were never possible have become possible, and, uh, or even law, and, uh, or public opinion, and on and on it goes. And so uh, it's really, really interesting. It seems like uh, that America has shaken her fist in the face of God. But America needs to understand that she's not big enough uh, to shake her fist in the face of God and get by with it. Amen, and get by with it. Psalm 33, verse 12 says this here. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now, I know that's a, a, a direct promise and hope for the nation of Israel, but it's a great principle, and I'll show you some verses. There are principles for any nation, and I, I want to follow that up if I could today. History shows us that nations and civilizations, uh, they just don't die. Their leaders and people uh, are first deceived, and then they are judged, and then destroyed by God. It starts when a nation begins to decide for themselves, discerning what is good and evil, uh, what is right and what is wrong, with the purpose of excluding God, being apart from God, they become their own final authority outside of God. It's a nation that denies God's rightful place as sovereign over all. And it begins to allow humanity itself to be able to become its own master and its own God. America, America seemingly has surrendered from we the people, from being under God to giving government, education, the media to America's, to become America's masters and dictators and God. Many, many years ago, just like education, that you're not permitted to mention God anymore or whatever, a fellow by the name of Martin Luther wrote this many, many years ago. He said, I am much afraid that schools will prove to be great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth, I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not increasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Uh, because without God, you follow humanism, and then it becomes corrupt. And so we see that it's going all on all over our country at this time. And it just, it breaks your heart. But in doing so, America has fallen prey, has been deceived by the oldest lie in history. Genesis 3, 5 says this here. For God doth not know that, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. now get this, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And man has begun to think he doesn't need to follow God. Now he can be his own God. And man has begun to follow that. And when a nation listens to this lie that they don't need God, they're on their own, unbelievable things begin to happen. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and following. And just pick up on some things what God says. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, what? Isn't, isn't that interesting? They think they're, they're the smartest people on earth, but in reality, leaving God out makes them fools. The fool has said in his heart there's no God, right? And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and uh, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Now, 
When God gives a nation up because they've turned their back on him and put other things ahead of him, notice the consequences of doing that. Gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature. Here we go, Mother Earth, all right? More than the Creator, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause, God gave them up, and when he gives them up, what happens? Unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So when a group of people begin to exclude God from being a big part of their life, and as a nation, God gives that people over to these consequences. So everything we see is an indication that we already are under the judgment of God. It's already we are reaping some of the consequences that are taking place because we don't want God to be our Lord, our King, our Savior, to follow his truth. It's an it's amazing thing what's taking place. And when a nation believes this lie, some things happen. It dethrones God and deifies man and his achievements. It exalts human reason as supreme when in reality the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. It trusts education and science without God to solve its problems. It begins to believe man is evolving into perfection. Man is perfectible. <laughs> he now in himself has all the answers for life. It replaces God's word of moral standards with situation ethics. Example would be in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. He says this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent, in their own sight. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen in this country that we're living in today. When you leave God, the nation, it, begin, it promotes sensuality and pleasure and instant gratification. They have already taxed and traded our future away. Do we not understand that? Our country has done that. Also, it strives for a world utopia of prosperity and peace. And we're even so naive, we could, our nation says, well, we just need to love each other. While other nations are building stronger, we're cutting our defenses down that we won't be able to protect ourselves adequately before it's all over with. Amen. Not only that, it makes, it makes the government the sovereign dictator of everyone. Ephesians 5, 6 says this here. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now, I can go on and do what I want to do, but there is a consequence for doing what's wrong. Amen? And the government, especially the federal government, it's trying to control every area of our life. I just saw this week that we were asked, children are asked, to, if they hear any racist remarks within their home, to report it. It's unbelievable what's going on. But this was said by Woodrow Wilson long ago about a big government. The history of liberty is a history of limitations of governmental power. Limitations on it. Not the increase of it. When we resist, therefore, the concentration of power, we are resisting the powers of death because concentration of power, like government, is what always precedes the destruction of human liberties. That's big government 
in action. Not only that, it becomes intolerant of any who proclaim God is greater than it. Boy, today, if you don't live by political correctness, you're in trouble. Isn't that true? Huh? Just by what I said in Romans chapter 1, they're trying to silence that. Isn't that true? Amen. And then also, a nation that turns its back on God, it has prepared itself for a fall for God's judgment. Psalm 917 says this, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Proverbs 14, 34 says this here, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but a sin is a reproach to any people. As believers, I'm sure you have to agree with me, we've seen America, we've seen our social decay, our cultural decay, our moral decay. If we look about us, we see lawless, lawlessness. You have to be armed if you go down to Indianapolis just about anymore, don't you? We're seeing the loss of economic discipline. Look at Detroit, Cleveland, now Los Angeles. It's unbelievable what's taking place. The rising bureaucracy of federal government. One of the hardest things for small business is to do all the paperwork that the government wants you to do, let alone have to get out there and work. It's unbelievable. We're seeing the dumbing down of education. We're seeing the loss of tradition. As a matter of fact, they even condemn our past history in this country here. It's an awful thing. They put political correctness and feelings even over truth. We see the rise of immorality, the loss of religious beliefs, the devaluing of human life. And right before our eyes, and we see these many, many things that go against what Scripture says for the child of God. These things are not what made America great. These things are not what our American founding fathers built this nation upon. These are not what our American soldiers have fought for and died for. Today is Memorial Day. Why and what did our soldiers fight and die for? Why did they love this country so much? It was ingrained in them to be a patriot. God first, family, okay? You have God first, your family, then your country, and many times just the soldier that's standing next to you. I have a theory. There's a reason why so many of our soldiers coming back from recent wars are having so, much, so many emotional problems because they haven't had a nation that's properly sent them to war to win and a nation who has not supported them or has changed so much that they're not in their corner and they come back and they're confused why in the world they were even there. Amen. Amen. They need our prayers, our men do. They need our support. And I hope we will always give that to them. James Madison uh, said some things, but I want to give you some reasons why America has been great. The United States was the first nation in history that created the belief that people should govern themselves. We the people. James Madison said this, this country's birth is a revolution which has no parallel in the annals of human history. They call it the great experiment where we set up a system where we would have no dictatorship, no kingship, but we, the people. We are not a democracy. We are a republic. And that is very, very important. Secondly, America is really the land of the free. Most people want to come here. George Washington said many years ago, the love of liberty is interwoven with every ligament of American hearts. Freedom of expression, freedom of press, freedom of free market, freedom of faith. What a great place. Number three, no other country has done a better job of establishing equal rights for all citizens. We've had our failures but no nation has worked harder to eliminate discrimination and to protect the rights of all minorities. 
all are created equal. And even when we were doing wrong, we stood up and admitted it and passed the civil rights laws. Instead of always criticizing what we've done in the past, they ought to stand in applause for us standing up and correcting and always trying to do what's right. <laughs> Number four, America has been the place where dreams could become true. Many lives have been like fairy tales for people. The laborer's son who can become a doctor. The immigrants who become movie stars. <laughs> The honest person, even an actor, can become the governor and eventually the president of the United States. A place to have a chance to better one's life. That's the America. I have to apologize. I love American Idol this year. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was great this year. And the two best singers were the final two. That was the first. And uh, it was real interesting, but I'm so glad Caleb, he's a rocker. Now, some of you guys are rocker, that's from hell. Well, I, li I, <laughs> I like Caleb, okay? Because when he came out, he didn't leave anything in his heart. It was all on that stage. And he came, he comes from a very, very poor family, a real poor family. They don't have much. And now he's an American Idol. That repeats itself over and over every day in our history from education to politics to military to jobs or whatever it might be. Only in America could that be possible. We thank God for that. Number five, Americans enjoy one of the highest living standards in the world. We live longer, are healthy, are healthier, enjoy safe, comfortable lives more so than the rest of the world. I've seen some of the rest of the world firsthand. They have nothing that we have. We have jobs, hospitals, parks, universities, libraries, museums, cure for diseases. We have the best food in the world. You can't beat a good old cheeseburger. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Number six, America has welcomed and united so many from other countries. America has become the world's great melting pot. Different nationalities, backgrounds, ethnic differences, even religious backgrounds. In the past, it's changing now, but in the past, when one became American, there was a spirit of oneness, and the people were more proud of not their ethnic background, but the fact they could be called an American. Amen. Amen. Number seven, our military has been the greatest defender of freedom in the world. We've heard the call and stepped up, even with our lives. We've saved the world twice, by the way, through world wars, many other countries and nations from being conquered. And it was our military that left their blood on foreign fields that made those things possible. And we should never, ever forget that. <laughs> Eight, America is a world leader in scholarship, invention, and so on. The finest universities, research centers, the record of American inventions and discoveries go on and on. <laughs> Our medical research facilities are among the world's best. Yesterday I went and, uh, to my granddaughter's graduation from Franklin College and uh, Lech Leiter from, from Lilly's, its CEO of the company, he spoke at the graduation and uh, his is a real success story from down and working through the process or whatever it might be. But it's, it's an amazing thing, the fact that we have so much and have created so much. I don't want to be racial, but let me say something to you. I really believe this, that we in America, whether you were white or whatever color, we have created the greatest industry the world has ever seen, and we should be proud of that very, very much. 
Amen. We've been the leader in space exploration, communications. Number nine, Americans have been a, among the most generous people on earth. We have extraordinary philanthropic and civic organizations in the world. And America is the greatest, largest source of humanitarian aid worldwide. When a disaster comes up, whether it's an earthquake or a typhoon or whatever it might be, or somebody's been invaded and left behind, America is one of the first ones who steps up with government aid and even private donations from individual people of this country. And then lastly, the United States is a nation. And the reason all of this other stuff works, the reason it's held together, is the fact that America has looked to God for guidance. Our founding fathers acknowledged this and made sure we could freely worship without fear of reprisal or worry about our government. But in these times, we've never had three branches of government who have been so reluctant to say, let us pray. Oh, Ben Franklin, that first time, saying we're getting ready to make the biggest decision, what form of government we have, we need to fall on our knees right now and ask God for help. That's the way our founding fathers were. Now our government tells us that's against our founding fathers and our constitution and so on, that life is a result of blind chance. I thought we were created by our creator, it even says, right? We can have that. Our government says we can have morality without true religion. Hmm. Pornography is harmless adult pleasure. Whatever is legal is moral. Is that true? Of course not. And then when a group of people try to get something that is righteous, they say, you can't legislate morality when they've just legislated morality. Isn't that amazing how it works? They say, they tell us today, a fetus is not human. Hmm? They tell us that gay marriage is God's marriage. And I beg to pardon with them. We even have a U.S. congressman last week who's, who said that communism works. That's where the state controls. Communism has slaughtered, annihilated millions upon millions upon millions in the hundreds of millions of people. And they continue to. But this congressman hasn't received very much rebuke from our Senate or our Congress. Understand something. Our men and women of America's military fought for 50 years communism, and we won. And then to turn around and say, it's okay. And for our government to go in that direction is a thumb in the eye of those who gave their very life in fighting it for our country. I close with a few little quotes just to remind us. Jewish Yego Allen said this, a nation which cannot respect its past will lose its future. John Adams, our second president, by the way, he said, the, the four most influential individual people that helped our Declaration of Independence and so on were four preachers, four ministers of the gospel of Christ. He said this, John Adams, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. So great is my veneration of the Bible that the earlier my children begin to read it, the more confident will be my hope that they will prove useful, useful citizens of their country and respectful members of society. George Washington says, it is impossible to govern rightly without God and the Bible. Amen? They landed on Plymouth Rock in 1620, 200 years later, they had a celebration. Daniel Webster, he reminded the people of the character of our origin. 
He said this, our fathers were brought hither by their high veneration for the Christian religion. They journeyed by its light, labored in its hope. They thought to incorporate its principles with the elements of their society and influence everything from its institutions, civil, political, or literary. Christianity. John Jay said this, it is the duty, it is well, the privilege and interest of, Christian, of a Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for its rulers. President Calvin Coolidge said the foundation of our society and our government rests so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings, the Bible, would cease to be practically universal in our country. And for us to think we're not supposed to mention God when our people who come before us said, if we forget God, we have no nation as it was created. Amen. Amen. One last quote here. Chief Justice Earl Warren, back in 1954, said this. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning, from the beginning, been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia, the charter of New England, the charter of Massachusetts Bay, or the fundamental orders of Connecticut, the same objective is present. A Christian land governed by Christian principles. Amen. He said, I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in the freedom of belief, of expression of assembly, of petition, the dignity of the individual, the sanctity of the home, equal justice under law, and the reservation of powers to the people. I like to believe we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Amen? What time is it back there? I can't see. Right at it. I was reading some things, and this is my third closing. But I read this, and I thought it was good. Just bear with me, and it closed the service. And I can't read it because I can't see it. <laughs> How about that? It's a real small print. But I want you to, to hear this. I think it tells us where we are. Today, the bleak winds of destiny are howling in protest to the way we are living. It is sheer folly to suppose that the strength and security of America lies in the vast economic resources, industrial prowess, scientific ingenuity, diplomatic skill, or military might. Our real defense as a nation rests in the spiritual convictions, character, and commitment of its citizenry. Our forefathers founded this nation upon the Christian faith, and it will live so long as the Lord is our God. The pilgrim fathers left a land where they were persecuted to find a land wherein every man through countless ages would have the right to worship God in his own way. When these strong and stalwart champions of the new order landed at Plymouth Rock, they knelt upon the shore and dedicated this country to God. When the Constitutional Convention met at Philadelphia to organize the nation and write the Constitution, Venerable Old Ben Franklin called on the members of the convention to fall up on their knees and pray for divine wisdom. Today, as of old, each of the coins of our pockets bear the inscription, In God We Trust. Sin separates a nation from God. Sin separates this nation from God. But we are not without hope. I agree that the picture has a dark background, but I would like to place a crimson cross and bursting tomb and a glowing sky in the foreground. From the very throne of God, there comes this message to us. 
Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We must return to the faith of our fathers. We must go to our knees in humility and prayer, in contrition and confession, in repentance and the forsaking of sin. We must go back to the cross where the incarnate Son of God was cursed, condemned, crucified for man, the creature's sin. The crisis is acute. The danger is imminent. Time is running out. Something miraculous must happen in the heart of the soul of America now before it's too late. The choice is clear. If, it, if we repent, we'll be good. But if we don't, we perish. It's revival or ruin, Christ or chaos. The question of the hour is, which way, America? Amen? And there's only... And there's only way, one way, that America has any hope or chance for a future that has a God who loves them, is there for them. To follow is for us as the people of God to get on our knees and get on our face and begin to pray to the God of scriptures and begin to seek his face and cry out, for mercy for America. It doesn't look like there's any hope in the direction our country's going. Unless there would be a great awakening. Huh? But I really believe there could be pockets of a group of people who love God, not ashamed of God, they're great citizens, on and on it goes, are those people who make sure that they stand up for that God. Father, we love you with all of our hearts. We love our country. And sometimes it's a cross pool. Sometimes we love our country more than we love you. And we don't want to do that. But we want to love you first. You're our priority. And that's the only way we can be good citizens. To render under Caesar that which is due Caesar and the things unto you that are due you. So I just pray for our country. I pray for our leaders. I pray that something would happen that would in such a way shake them up to their very core that it would cause them to fall on their face and say, God, we've been wrong. God, we have sinned. Please forgive us. Your way is our direction. God, that would be wonderful. But even if not, God, we love you. We want to proclaim your name more than America because yours is the only name that's above every name that's worthy of our glory, of our praise of you. So we tell you today, thank you for those who made the ultimate sacrifice, who made it possible for us to be here today. May we not ever forget that sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said?